All right, again, thank you everybody for being here. Um, real quick, we're going to go through an introduction of the commission members. Um, I'm Senator Matt Brass. I'm down in District 28, representing Kelly County, Heard County, Truth County, Carroll County, and Park Fulton County. Um, to my left here, I have the President Pro Tem of the Senate, Butch Miller, out of Gainesville, Georgia, the 49th District. Uh, and then not with us today is uh, Senator Ben Watson. He's from Savannah, the uh, first district. He's also chairman of Veterans Military Homeland Security, and he's also a young doctor. Um, Representative Grappley, my distinguished co-chairman, will introduce his house members. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm also on the Senate side, also appointed by the Lieutenant Governor. Uh, we have some citizen appointees. I've got Dale Jackson out of Truth County. Um, and then I have Sheriff James Woodruff, who's the Truth County Sheriff. Thank you, Senator Brass. Uh, my name is Michael Bradley. I represent House District 67. That's going to be the west side of Douglas County and the south side of Holden County, which is my home county. Uh, I'm going to let my members introduce themselves. So I'm happy to be on this committee. I'm looking forward to serving on this committee and how we can benefit the state of Georgia. And I couldn't have asked for better co-chairman and Senator Brass. And I'll go ahead and let the, the members from the House side, appointed by Speaker David Ralston, uh, introduce themselves starting with Rosen Powell. David Clark, State Representative for District 98, this in Gwinnett County, the new coach of the Swanee, the two cities, and I'm in so many of my fourth year now, same term. All right, thank you, everybody. We, we appreciate this commission, all the members of it, um, and their willingness to serve, because what we have ahead of us is, is a, a lot of work to do. We've got a long road, there's many hurdles. Um, the system that we are in front of is not set up to move fast. And so I kind of want to set the expectations that we're not going to be able to snap our fingers and make it happen. Um, for those of you that have been involved with this for for years, I think y'all probably understand that more than, than a lot. So, um, but for sake of time, you know, I kind of want to go over some, some really some house rules. And, and the purpose of the house rules are really more important than what the actual rules are. Um, you know, it's, like I said, we have so much work to do on this, so much work. And so the efficiency of these public hearings, we have got to move through very quickly because we have a lot of information that we've got to absorb. We have a lot of, a lot of different people with a lot of different views that we need to hear from. So um, I would ask that everyone please abide by these house rules, and uh, you know if, if you can, if you just want to pull your hair out and shout something, I'll just ask you to step outside and do that. Um, but real quick, some simple house rules. Number one, every person in here has a right to an opinion, and we're not all going to agree on everything said. But every single person needs to be treated with dignity and respect when they're in this room. You go outside of these, this four-wall room, you can do whatever you want. But in here, we're all going to treat each other with respect. And if you cannot do that, you're going to be asked to leave. I want everybody to nod that that's, that's good. Because I know we live in a society where we think it's not okay to the truth is this. We're going we're gonna to buy that. So rule, that's rule one. Rule 1A, one I want everybody to take your phone out right now and turn it off. Or at least turn the ringer off. I'm sorry, you don't have to turn it off. Turn the ringer off. Um, anybody want to video, it's already it's already being live fed through our um, house.ga.gov website. 
as well as senate.ga.gov site. Um, so there's be plenty of video. Uh, you don't have to video and try to get a, a gotcha moment because somebody's already got us. So, um, rule number two, this one's important for the efficiency of these meetings. No comments from, from the audience. The only people speaking will be the members of this committee and the people that are recognized by, by the chairman, myself, or Representative Gravity, uh, that will either be at that podium or on that microphone over there. Um, so uh, please just please abide by that. Whether you agree with what a person's saying or not, if you don't like it, uh, just do the old Southern thing and say, bless their little heart. Um, uh, number three for our speakers and for when we get into the public comment, uh, we're going to be very strict on the time. This is not to um, this is not to limit your your right to to a voice. Uh, this is to allow all voices to be heard as many as possible. And uh, again, we we're limited in time, so we're going to try to move very efficiently. Um, I will hold up a sign. Here it is. I'm going to give everybody a 30 second notice. And I'm going to give you a stop and then we're going to turn off the microphone. Okay? Um, Representative Peaks over there looking nervous, but <laughs> he'll just shout. But anyway, with that being said, um, Chairman Gravely is now going to kind of go to the history and the purpose of this commission. Representative Gravely. Thanks, Senator Bress. Um, we're, we're gathered here today based upon the last five years of legislation in the state of Georgia. Uh, that legislation was pioneered by a gentleman that you will hear from today, Representative Allen Peake. Uh, 2014, House Bill 885 was brought before the General Assembly. That opened up the question all across Georgia about medical cannabis and its effects on those who could benefit from it. That bill did not pass, but the following year, uh, or that summer, uh, there was a study committee that was commissioned, and they traveled the state to hear uh, from folks like we're going to hear from today. They heard from parents, they heard from law enforcement, they heard from uh, medical professionals, uh, industry professionals, they heard from everyone ranging every aspect of the spectrum. Uh, we came back to the legislature and passed House Bill 1 which provided for uh, medical cannabis oil. We actually took the code section from the 1980 law uh, that was passed in Georgia, and uh, we added eight diagnoses at that time. Uh, the following year, we were able to come back and raise uh, the THC limit uh, to provide the low THC oil, which is now legal in Georgia. Uh, House Bill 65 also added some of the uh, diagnosis. We were able to add autism prior to that as well. So that part of the House Bill 65 uh, provided for this study committee. Because what we have found in the state of Georgia uh, and the registry, which uh, we are very proud to say has not been compromised, uh, we are hearing testimony from families and citizens across the state that are seeing wonderful results, positive results, from treating with the low THC and soil. But that registry, which now includes 681 registered physicians and 5,570 patients here in the state of Georgia is lacking one thing, and that is access to the medicine that they are legally allowed to possess in our state. I want to make clear what this commission uh, has been charged with. Uh, we are charged with a sole purpose, one singular mission, and that is to look at access uh, for what is currently legally allowed in Georgia. This commission will not entertain lowering or raising uh, any aspect or percentages of the current oil. Uh, the commission will, not, will also not entertain uh, the recreational argument uh, of whether or not uh, marijuana should be uh, legalized for recreational purposes in the state of Georgia. Uh, the members of this committee have been charged with one thing, that is to find out what pathway uh, for the patients in Georgia uh, who are on this registry, uh, who obtain their card and possess their card, uh, how can they access the medicine uh, that this General Assembly has said that they are allowed to possess. Uh, 
medicine that we have seen uh, affect families, both young and old. So as we move forward, that, forward in these committee hearings, uh, please know that uh, whatever your feelings may be, whatever opinions may be out there, uh, the sole charge of this commission is to determine how Georgia uh, will provide access to the current patients registered on the Georgia Medical Cannabis Registry. All right, with that, um, if you, the public comment section, if you wanted to sign up for that, that was outside. Um, we'll open that up again. And we're going to take a break in about, I don't know, about an hour. We'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back. Uh, so if you want to sign up, then you can. And again, we're going to have, you know, 30 minutes or so for that. So we're going to, it, it will be limited, but we'll just kind of, we'll do it on the first come, first serve. And, um, you know, we just ask you to be very respectful during that time. But uh, with that, we're going to get into our presentations. And to kick us off, uh, we have Representative Alan Peak out of Macon, Georgia. And although he deserves that, um, again, for sake of time, let's just keep, keep all that to the minimum. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Grass, Chairman Gravely. Thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to come uh, speak today uh, to this distinguished group. My colleagues that I've served with for many years, it's a pleasure to be back with you and the citizens. I want to look forward to uh, the hearing of this commission. So, so I want to do real quick. Okay with uh, uh, the chairman, just give it a brief overview. Uh, chairman Grab, at yeah, some point, let's just kind of walk through a couple things that I, I think are important. Just get an update of where we are uh, on medical cannabis in, in the state. You guys have to help me. That's uh, you know, right there. There you go. HB1, the lady soap act, was named after the lady Cox, a little girl who was suffering 100 200 seizures a day, a constituent of mine, um, who was, whose mom reached out to me and basically put very simple message, please help my family. As I got to know this family, uh, and we all got to know little Haley, uh, we, we were compelled to push forward for some type of breakthrough to allow Georgia to allow uh, access, certainly to allow legal possession of medical cannabis law here in Georgia. That was all that in HB1. Uh, Haley's Hope Act was signed by the governor in April 2015. You'll see a couple of folks up there. Senator Miller, who was a huge, uh, a huge impact in the Senate on getting that bill passed that year, was there for the bill signing. It was a very special day, uh, as you see, many families there. That's little Haley Cox right there, her mom right there, Janae Cox, as well as uh, dozens and dozens of families who were there and fought very hard uh, to see that bill pass. Uh, uh, what did HB1 do? It provided uh, immunity from uh, prosecution for possession of medical cannabis oil for eight qualifying conditions. And you can't possess more than 20 ounces uh, of the oil at a given time. Patient must register with the state uh, in order to have um, the legal right to possess. Uh, medical cannabis oil it cannot exceed more than five percent THC. Uh, the conditions that were allowed under that first bill were uh, seizures, cancer, ALS, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, Parkinson's disease, mitochondrial disease, and sickle cell disease. We were one of uh, the first states in the country to allow legal possession for sickle cell disease as, as well too. Uh, that was followed up by SB 16 that was uh, authored by Senator Ben Watson, who was on this committee, not here today, uh, that added six conditions to uh, the law, Alzheimer's, AIDS, autism. Again, I think we were the second or third state in the country to add autism to the list of qualifying conditions. Uh, Tourette's syndrome, peripheral neuropathy, uh, epidermolosis mellosa, which is a rare skin disease, a young boy and his family were the expression behind that. Uh, we also added eligibility of uh, individuals in hospice care. Uh, it also provided us responsibility with other states, which was a key issue for those who were traveling with the oil uh, and we reduced reporting requirements for uh, positions. And then this past session, uh, HB 65 was, was passed. Uh, Senator Matt Brass was instrumental in getting this passed in the Senate. Uh, they added PTSD and intractable pain to the list of qualifying conditions uh, so that we now have uh, 16 medical conditions that are allowed to create this commission study recommended solution uh, that was signed by Governor Deal in 2018. Uh, 
Chairman Gravely had a couple of comments, but I just want to highlight again uh, that as of right now, as of July 31st, uh, there are 646 positions that have registered with the state to properly register their individuals. Uh, a couple of those are here today. Thank you to, to those of you who have uh, been going through that process. We now have 5,400 over 5,400 patients that are registered uh, with the state to legally possess uh, medical cannabis oil. But here's some interesting uh, information. If you want to look at the breakdown of, um, of the conditions that are, um, folks have been signing up for, uh, seizures is the number one condition. Uh, many of those are children uh, who suffer from seizures, but it, we have just as many adults uh, who are benefiting as well, too. Uh, cancer uh, is the second uh, largest condition. Peripheral neuropathy, uh, which was added two years ago, uh, is third. Multiple sclerosis, autism, and some interesting things, intractable pain that uh, was just added on July 1st has 177 people uh, signed up, as well as PTSD of uh, 67. So uh, if you do the math, that's exactly out of 100%, but some people qualify under several conditions. But uh, uh, that is the registry and the makeup of the, uh, of the registry at this point. Uh, here, here's the issue that uh, we've been averaging about 300 additions to the registry each month for the last five to six months. Uh, in July, when we had PTS and contract the the number jumped to 472. Uh, I fully expect uh, that possibly by the end of the year, that uh, while we only probably have 5,400 people on the register now, we may be close to 10,000 people uh, maybe by the time the legislature convenes again in January. Uh, there's clearly a demand and clearly uh, a request from the citizens of this state uh, to be able to have legal possession, but also the legal right to, to access uh, medical cannabis law here in the state. Uh, so, what uh, what are the challenges that continue to remain for those that are properly registered in the state? Every single day, every single day, I'm getting a social media message, an email, a text message, some type of message with with with, with, a, couple, with a couple questions. I've signed up for the registry. What do I do now? Or how do I now get the order? I've gone to the doctor, gone through the registry process, uh, paid my $25 to get my card, uh, but the doctor or the pharmacist, uh, whoever I'm chatting with, uh, is telling me, I can't help you now at this point. You're on your own of how do you get the oil at this point. And so uh, that, that is the challenge that continues to remain for uh, patients here in Georgia. And so here, here's some of the solutions. Since they still can't, they still can't access metal, uh, metal cannabis oil in Georgia, uh, with limited exceptions, very low THC oil, uh, hemp oil, if you will. Folks can buy it online, buy it over the internet. Um, it's less than 0.3% it's considered hemp. It's a gray area of the law, uh, but you could go on Amazon right now and order uh, hemp oil or CBD oil. Uh, the problem is that you may not have any idea of what is in that product. You may not know how much CBD content is. You may not know if it's got any THC oil. Uh, it's supposed to have less than 0.3% if it's going to be sold. On, uh, and, but it's still a very gray area as well in the federal law. So, uh, so it, and what we're finding also is that many of the conditions that are allowed under Georgia law need an elevated level of THC uh, that's allowed under Georgia law to 5%. So this federal oil, while it's readily available, is really uh, is risky. You don't know what you're getting in it, and it doesn't really provide the relief that many Georgia citizens are expecting. Uh, others are uh, traveling to another state to obtain it and risk violating federal law by bringing it back to Georgia. Uh, we've heard many stories of folks going to another state, obtaining the oil from a, a reputable manufacturer, maybe in another state, uh, uh, but they risk the uh, prospect, uh, they have the prospect of being arrested if they were found because they are violating federal law by transporting. Uh, Cannabis oil across that line. It's also just not in practice. It's also impractical for many people. Many people sign the registry of debilitating illnesses. They uh, are already stretched financially uh, to the max because of their condition. And so to tell them and simply go, well, we can just go to another state and get it, buy it, bring it back, is just a uh, sign of uh, a lack of compassion, quite frankly. Uh, because uh, many of these things, it's just not practical for them to travel to another state to obtain it 
uh, the, the financial burden of that and the logistical burden of that is just, it's just not realistic. Uh, thirdly, many are buying a plant off the street. They can know themselves. We know of several families that have just said, hey, you know, I can't travel out of state, um, but I can, I, I do know that I can go to any street corner in our state and buy weed off the street and, uh, and convert it into oil uh, myself. And that just sends chills down my spine as it should for each of us. Here we are, we're forcing soccer moms, uh, dads with children with autism, <coughs> grandparents with Parkinson's disease, to one, go try and find uh, and buy marijuana off the street from somebody they don't know. They have no idea what is in that plant, the content of CBD or THC ratio. Uh, and so it is incredibly risky, uh, as well as being uh, a violation of Georgia laws. And then finally, uh, many folks have gone to an underground network. Um, we have been very open about uh, my wife and I that over the last several years we have committed to providing medical cannabis oil to as many families as we possibly can. <coughs> that we have a record manufacturer who we trust who uh, gets the medical cannabis oil here to Georgia. I don't know how it gets here, so I'm not involved in, in, the, in the transportation of it across state lines. Um, but when we get when it gets here, we are providing it to families uh, at no cost. Um, and, and we have incredible stories as a result of this process. Um, in fact, I'll share some of them if we have time. This the commission, um, the chairman. Uh, but, but the reality is that is not sustainable. We have had to over the last three or four weeks. This network of families that we have been working with have had to finally tell folks who are contacting us. No, we cannot provide the product to you because we cannot get enough here to sustain the request that we're having. It's the old uh, limited supply and incredible demand problem. And so uh, there have been some very painful conversations with some very sick, um, physically sick individuals in our state and telling them that so I'm sorry that we just cannot help you anymore. And that's been a very painful uh, discussion. So that's just a, that, that option is just not a sustainable one as well. How about the national data? Let's look real quick at what's going on all over the country. There are now 46 states that have some form of medical cannabis law in the books. There are 31, 31 of 50 states have some form of cultivation inside their borders, allowing their citizens to be able to obtain or have possession of medical cannabis uh, in their state, including Florida and Arkansas, and our, our neighbors. Oklahoma just recently passed. Uh, law as well too. So uh, 15 have uh, possession on the law similar to what we have including our neighbors Tennessee, Alabama, and uh, South Georgia. So the point is this issue is coming across the country. It is going uh, to have to be dealt with uh, in Georgia because our citizens uh, are going to demand it. Uh, there's also some federal action in the CARES Act uh, that protects state medical programs and removes CBD from the Controlled Substance Act. We'll eliminate federal research barriers and ensure quality of military veterans. Uh, and so we could sit here and say, well, let's just wait for Congress to act. Uh, but in the meantime, our citizens suffer. And uh, quite frankly, I don't have a whole lot of faith in Congress acting on any issue these days. So uh, I think that's, that's not a viable option as well. Well, what's public opinion on this issue? Uh, AJC has done numerous polls on this issue. It's continued to be off the charts of uh, citizens who support access to medical canvas oil in our state. Uh, uh, Alive did a uh, survey about a year or two ago and showed 84% so support it. Um, so it's overwhelming support uh, for us to take action and move in this direction. Uh, here's to, to, the, to the members of the commission. And, uh, I guess what my hope is and what we fought for together, many of us, <laughs> through, through significant uh, fights uh, and discussion and debate, um, is, is what, what do we do? And that's the charge of this commission. I fully understand that uh, that's, that's, that's what you've been created for. And what I'd like to encourage is that we come up with uh, a recommendation similar to what has been done in several other states. Uh, we have limited licenses, five to ten, uh, that not be not a good slogan and be strictly like, regulated by the Department of Public Health um, uh, with the proper restrictions. And that's just an example. Um, I've got you know, for those who are fearful of this and wondering, okay, this is weed, we're about to prove, you know, this is it. 
This is what it is, a toy. Back of cattle soil it is uh, changing lives. And uh, Mr. Chairman, with that, I'll, I'll be back with questions or if you want to go sit down, I'll do that as family 
each other exactly what they're ingesting, correct? That is correct. Process an individual with process an individual would go through. Uh, they would contact me, uh, they would send me a medical summary. We will get that information, send it to the manufacturer, and the manufacturer will make a recommendation of okay, maybe they need a one-to-one -one CBD to THC ratio product or 20 to 1. And, uh, and we provide that product to them. It, it, it comes with a lab result uh, if, if the individual wants to see it. And uh, yes, this is a product that has been proven over time uh, to be safe and effective. Okay. Thank you, Bruce, for being here today. Appreciate your passion for this issue. Appreciate your leadership on this. Is there any psychotropic effect? to an individual who might want to abuse the chemical alcohol that's being provided? There, there is none. Uh, there is no psychotropic value whatsoever. If, if you took all of this, this is the most elevated level of THC in Georgia, the one-to-one -one product, but 4.9% THC. Uh, if an individual took this whole thing, uh, probably the worst thing that would happen to them is they either get really sleepy or they'd have to go to the bathroom a whole bunch. <laughs> and so, two bottles. Well, two bottles. Uh, Three bottles. Uh, there, there's, 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 there's very, very limited, if any. Uh, in fact, if you took a drug test, you may not have would, uh, would It would show up THC level. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Jim Rex, can I make you one final comment? I don't have <laughs> Actually, we have one more question. Dale Jackson. Thank you, uh, Representative Pete. Uh, obviously, you're someone who has traveled the country, have plenty of connections, know all of the local laws uh, in those states. I, I was wondering, as someone who has also traveled many different states, do you know of any state where I, as a Georgia resident of a autistic minor, can go, as many would have me do, and legally purchase cannabis oil for my son? Mr. Jackson, I, I, I would say probably the only place you could do it would be maybe one of the nine states that has recreational use. Maybe you could go there and buy the plant and convert it to an oil yourself, but maybe, um, but, but uh, I, I can't say I can tell you of a single one that has just medical, medical cannabis laws, uh, no recreational use. Uh, I'm not sure there is one. Yeah. Uh, I would inform you that, you probably know that better than I do, yeah. <laughs> legally there is not a single city or state in this country that I, a resident of Georgia, can travel to and purchase cannabis oil for my minor autistic so just one point of comment um, thanks thanks for this. this is in my five session years of, of dealing with this issue um, this is actually the third commission that has been created um, the first one we did hear stories of families the second one was a commission created to decide should we have access here in Georgia, and um, and that was voted down, voted down by that commission uh, to not allow access uh, here in Georgia, cultivation in Georgia. So, but while I fully understand that there are other study committees that many of you members may be serving on, and, you know, and other other commissions going on, and other important issues to our state, including the budget and Medicaid expansion, illegal immigration and education, and rural issues, fully understand. But to the dad, the grandfather who has Parkinson's disease, to the soccer mom who suffered from cancer, to the elderly woman who's debilitated with ALS, to the homosexual man who suffers from AIDS, <coughs> to the dad who has an autistic child, there is no greater issue on a day-to-day -day basis than coming up with a solution for medical cannabis oil in our state. 
And so I am incredibly optimistic about the work that this commission is going to do and encouraged by the solution that this commission will come up with. Thank you very much. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, Representative. We appreciate your service to this great state, especially to this call. So, very merry. Next up, we got Jillian Wooden. If you will come to the podium. In fact, all of the speakers um, will be coming to the podium with exception of one of our speakers. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Representative. If you would just introduce yourself and um, why you're here and, and go right into what you have to say. My name is Jillian Wooden. I am here because I have an
how will we get it? And as a parent who's been involved with this from day one, four or five years ago, you would think, you know, they could get their oil, but no. It's very, very hard for us to get their oil. Very hard. Um, there have been times where, you know, we've got to let them know three or four months ahead of time. And even then, it's, it's a problem. So there's a great concern about access in this state. You know, what you're allowed to get in oil doesn't work for kids like my son. And so, I, you know, as far as what this commission is doing and what it means for my son, it's a huge deal as far as where this goes next year. Thank you, Jillian. Um, any questions from the committee? Well, I'll, I'll ask one. Um, so, you said you're getting it from someone in Georgia. Are you, are, are you having traveled to go get it, or is it? Yes. Um, what is that process? The process from start to finish, you know, just, um, I have learned that there needs to be some sort of advance notice given. Um, more than two weeks, um, usually about a month out of six weeks, you know, <coughs> Out where to meet. Usually it's within an hour, hour and a half drive. And, I mean, I've met at grocery stores, I've met at gas stations, I've met at the Capitol. I mean, it's just whatever is convenient. And if you were to purchase the oil, say on the black market, do we have a cost involved? Do you have a, I mean, have you ever not gotten it?
how the impact the impact of his choice is used of marijuana. They left that park, they got out on I-40, drove right into rush hour traffic. That young lady ended up losing control of Chase's car in the curb, running about 70 miles per hour. They left the road and struck a tree. And she had just smoked marijuana at the park with them before she got behind the wheel. When they hit the tree, when they hit the tree, they were running about 60 miles per hour. Chase was killed instantly. It took firefighters almost an hour to get the three of them out of the vehicle. The other two were transported to the hospital right away with serious injuries. Over the next several weeks, they were able to recover from their injuries to the extent that they could return home and continue their recovery. But seven months after the wreck, only a few weeks prior to what would have been her first court appearance, the young lady had been driving Chase's car that day, a regular marijuana user, died after a fire broke out in her apartment. Fire chief said after their investigation, he believes that she poured gasoline all over the floor of her apartment, stood in the middle of it, and ignited. She died the next day in the hospital. There were two suicide deaths found. So, you know, you may ask, well, Mr. Rogers, what does any of this have to do with medical marijuana? Well, number one, your brain doesn't know if it's medical or recreational, it's just THC. And then, you know, just a, just a few weeks prior to Chase's death, he told my wife, Kim, they went out to dinner together, just the two of them, and he told my wife, Kim, Mom, marijuana's not that bad. It's not as, it's not as dangerous as alcohol, or besides that, they're legalized again. A number of states now, before you know it, will be legal across the entire United States. Legislators in other states have unknowingly, unwittingly sent a message to Chase, just like they did to thousands of other kids that marijuana was safe to use. And thousands of them believe that it's safe to use and they get behind the wheel. And then there's my friend, Corrine Lamarca, who lives in Ohio. Her daughter, Jennifer, was not a user. She was in her car just minding her own business at a traffic light. When a man high on medical marijuana drove through a light at over 80 miles per hour, he got on her car, pushed it into a blocked building that then collapsed on her car. Jennifer died, 22 years old. Chase was 20 when he died. And so, you know, I, I appreciate that you're trying to solve the problem here today. And I'm, I'm in the I really am. But I, I just want to caution you to be careful that in solving one problem that you don't create another bigger problem. Law enforcement does not have the tools, the same tools, to detect and to enforce impairment via marijuana that they do to, to detect and enforce drug driving. Just go talk to anyone in law enforcement dealing with this issue. Go talk to the DAs. You'll see. So I just want to ask you to please carefully think about what you're going to do to protect the motorists in Georgia as you move forward with this. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Any, any, more, any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Okay, next up we have Kim Edson. Again, Kim, if you could just introduce yourself a um, little bit about why you're here and then get into the presentation. Thank you. I'm here because I'm the mother of a 15-year-old boy named Christian. I don't have him on a slide, but I hope you can see there's his dad. He's an honorary member of his middle school football team. He has cerebral palsy, so he doesn't actually play, but he's their good luck charm. He says. shows up in most of their games, and they, they just love on him. So. But Christian has cerebral palsy, and he uses a wheelchair um, to get around. He's 95 pounds. He's 5'3". So he's a bit, of, he's a bit of a boy for me. 
so keep moving around. He uh, started having daytime seizures when he was five, but those are under control with a pharmaceutical drug called Keppra. Um, however, he was diagnosed with a fairly rare seizure disorder called ESES seizure disorder uh, about five years ago. That stands for something really hard to say. I'm going to try it. Electrical status epilepticus in sleep. And what that means is his seizures happen at night. Um, you could walk in his room and you wouldn't know he's having one because they're just visible on an EEG, just brain waves spiking like crazy all night long. Um, so in his case, his initial spike waves that diagnosed him with this showed that he was spiking about 95% of the night. And what this meant was we were seeing a very drowsy, sleepy kid all day, and we just didn't know why. We thought he just, that was part of cerebral palsy. Maybe that's just how it is. Um, but finally, this neurologist, Brandon Morris, met with us and said, no, this is a real thing. I think your son has this condition. We need to treat it. Um, let's make sure. Let's diagnose it. And because if you don't, and he quoted a medical um, report, and it said, if left unchecked, this disorder can cause significant cognitive and language impairment. Amelioration of the continuous spikes must occur to improve the neuropsychological outcome. And what he was trying to tell me was that my son would slowly degenerate over time, not be able to learn, and slowly lose his language skills if I didn't do something. So we switched to a local-based neurologist at CHOA, and she did the usual things people do. In this case, she gave my son high doses of Valium. Um, that just made him really fun, but it didn't do anything else. Um, we went in the hospital for three consecutive months for three days at a pop, and he took intravenous steroids at high doses. That didn't do anything either. And then we tried Monophy, which is another pharma school that many, many people try. That didn't work either. So after he failed to respond to all those treatments, our, our neurologist at that time, Dr. Hayumi Kim, suggested cannabis oil. And I was skeptical too. I was like, oh, geez, I don't know. Yeah, maybe that's just not a good idea. So I paused and did some research. And when I went back to her and said, I'm ready, she said, well, that's, your timing's kind of off because I'm no longer willing to sign your registration card to give you the oil. Uh, all I can suggest is you forge ahead on your own. Have a nice day. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know how to forge ahead on my own. Um, and as we left the hospital, after his last injection of um, high steroids, his, her PA, her uh, physician's assistant, pulled me aside to let me know that ESES seizure disorder could cause sudden death. So I should just be aware of that. But I still had no choice. I had nowhere to go, nothing to do, and I couldn't call my son. So um, I found another uh, neurologist who would sign for a medical marijuana card. And I went with him, and he signed my card. And then, of course, I had the same problem that Alan Pete showed us earlier, which was, I have the card, but now what do I do? So I went to a parent Focus training session. Focus is a group that supports parents with special needs children. And I met Shannon Cloud and some others who were involved in Georgia Hope seizure and um, learned an awful lot about the process, the legislation that was coming about, and learned that there was actually a way I could get a trial bottle of this oil to see if it would help my son. And we did try. We uh, took a bottle of CBD oil, which was her, her first suggestion because it was the easier um, oil to obtain, but it had no effect. So we, we tried, I think we tried that two times. I think we did two different bottles. I think we were just really hopeful, like maybe if we try it again, it'll work. It's like eating more ice cream, hoping somehow to leave it taste better the second time around. But it didn't make much sense. But then, um, because he has nighttime seizures, it made sense to try an oil called CBN oil, which uh, has uh, 0.015% THC. And um, is more targeted toward kids who have seizures at night. So we gave him the smallest dose possible for his weight, which was 0.35 milliliters. I wish I would have brought you the, the dropper. Um, imagining a milliliter is, you know, only like the length of your pinky fingernail, so it's 0.35 of your fingernail. So it's a very small amount. Um, but within a few weeks, we noticed a huge change. He started to sleep through the night after I think what 11 years of never sleeping. Because when he had these seizures and these spikes, he was never achieving REM sleep. I don't know how many of you could go to work each day if for years on end you never got into REM sleep. You'd be a mess, I'd be a mess, and he was a mess. I just didn't recognize it because I wasn't a neurologist. 
Um, his teachers started to notice a more consistent alertness at school. They asked me what we were doing. Have we been doing anything different? I was hesitant to tell them. Um, so to confirm what we thought of as anecdotal stories, uh, we asked to have another EEG to confirm that what we thought was happening really was happening. So we went in May of this past year, and his EEG came back 100% clean, not a single spike from the ESCS seizure disorder. So to go from 95% spike, constantly spiking all night long, to absolutely nothing, my husband and I were floored. Absolutely floored. So we need that oil. Um, I don't know what we'll do when we can't get it the way we've been getting it. Uh, I try not to think about that because I have plenty of other things that worry me late at night. So um, I just know that without the help of some people who have been very generous and forward thinking, uh, we would really be in a huge bind. We didn't send this oil with my son when he went to camp recently. He went to a sleepaway camp. And we were nervous to send it because, well, you know, what are you going to tell the camp counselor? Hey. <laughs> If you don't mind, um, this is some cannabis oil I'd like to give my child. So he said, all right, look, for four days, he'll live. I bet it'll be just fine. We'll just kind of deal with it. But when he got home, we noticed, again, his sleepiness, his lethargy. His, he, he's typically very sharp. It's actually really funny. He has a, a, a quick wit. All of that was gone just in a few days. So we started up again, and it took maybe a week before we noticed our child back again. So that's all we got.
That all, the, first of all, I want to thank the commission for allowing me to speak on that and, and try to explain our story. And uh, I want y'all to understand, I'm not a speaker. I won't speak to crowds this big. I won't teach Sunday school. I don't really speak up to church. But I am a dad, a pastor that loves my children. Our journey with epilepsy started at the tender age of four months old. Shortly after the decaf shot, Sydney had a fever. It spiked. It really, she didn't have a seizure. She was at my wife's parents' home in Cedar Town um, with her at the time. They just wanted to spend the night with them. The paramedics told us that this is common with uh, fever. It's called a fever on seizure. Okay, well, it, new to us, but we, we accepted it and moved on. That all changed about two months later at six months old. Sydney had a seizure that lasted 45 minutes. At that time, I had to put my daughter on my helicopter, fly her to my drive, Not knowing that I would see her alive again, I didn't know what we were facing here. Through a lot of prayer, we go to the car with the Scottish Rite. Her seizure lasted from the time she was on the helicopter, or when it started at home until she got them, they got her at the hospital. It lasted over 45 minutes. That was the first of six life flights to Scottish Rite Hospital. Once she was flown twice in the 24-hour period. We was uh, we we, we found neurologist. I went to through our insurance fell a pediatric neurologist. He just he prescribed vitamin B6 and started um, That didn't help. Sydney so continued having seizures. So at that time we, we fired that doctor and we came to Chile up there for kind of sky fire. We went through the PAs, went through this, we ended up with the doctor doctor from me. Doctor from me has been great for us. But first of all, they prescribed her feet bar calls. <coughs> feet bar calls were the first to do medicines for epilepsy in children. That you have to have a weaning process for y'all that don't know how this works. You have to start at a very little dose, titrate up over a period of time. Once that time is up, you prove that medicine not to work. Still at the higher dose. After that dose is proven not to work, you don't come off of it cold turkey. You have to lean off of that as well. But during that time, you have to start the second medication. You titrate it up. And at the time you're titrating it up, you're reducing the first one. So it's a joke in that. Seven fatal medications, my daughter was still having seizures. We went to Scottish Rite for a video EEG inspection scan. So radioactive diet is injected into her onset of the seizure. At that time, it goes through the origin of the seizure in the brain. It, it tries to cool the brain. We went in that morning. We knew the protocol. We were medicine that morning. We went to Scottish Rite at 6 o'clock that morning. <coughs> they stopped her medication that day. Sydney was having seizures constantly. She had a seizure that morning. Later on that day, they started to subside. Her medicine was taken away. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of that week, my child did not have a seizure. She was having multiple seizures a day. And for this child not to have a seizure in three days, and look at me in the eye when I sing the Barney song to her, and I know my wife was already hearing the Barney song. But I would ask her, I said, so you want to sing again? Uh-huh. She would look at me straight in the eyes, just speak to me in her eyes as clear as a I asked the doctor then, I said, do we ever see seizures? He said, eventually. Well, they put her back on her medication and tried to get a step extra week because of her seizures. After that, I asked my wife, I said, I, I think this is what's causing a lot of our issues. So at that time, we went to a follow-up to our doctor visit, and I told the doctor at the time, I said, I think this medication is causing most of our issues. I said, we need to come off the medication. He said, well, 
when you come off some of them. I said, no, sir, I think we need to come off all of them. You saw the video. You saw the EEG. We did not have any seizures for three days. We're back our medicine. We had seizures. After that, he looked at me and he said, you're playing with fire. I said, Dr. Felina, would you I would repeat what you told me? Sometimes you have to weigh out the quality of life. My wife, my wife and I have talked about this, and we're willing to take that chance, even when we bury her, or two, these issues would stop. But they're not going to stop taking this medication. He said, that's your choice to make. At the time, she was taking Lomictal, Zonogram, and Topamax. And the Topamax dose was 200 milligrams a day. My daughter was so lethargic, she was just a living, breathing mass of a person. I would come in from work, and I would say, hey, sweet, how are you today? Did you have a good day today? And all I got was a blank stare. She was so high on the pharmaceutical, she didn't even know she was in the world. We could cut her arm off. She would not flinch. You would take, we'd draw blood for liver enzymes, for, like the, the other parents testified. We, we had to go every six weeks and have liver enzymes checked to make sure that these, these medications were affecting her liver too much. We made that decision to remove her from the medication at the age of about eight years old. Um, it took about 16 months to wean her off of the three medications. After we had her weaned off, she started to walk. She started to function in life. She was, open, she was coming alive. She was not doped up anymore. Until one night we were sitting there and my wife's cousin called and said, hey, we're going to have a special on CNN tonight with Dr. Sanjay Gupta about medical marijuana for children with seizures. Oh, cool, we're watching the scene. Hey, we're very home. We turned the television on. I followed her along on the computer on the website. My wife was watching the show. The city was sitting here. And at that time, it was a little story. It was a story about a little girl named Charlotte Fiji. I'm sure most of you have seen this, this, this family. I was sitting there with tears in my eyes. I looked at Lisa, my wife. I said, honey, I think this is our last resort. Well, we started doing some research. We, we, we went away from medical doctors for a while to see the chiropractic and naturopathic doctors. My, uh, our naturopathic doctor found a company that had hemp oil capsules. So we would take and order those, break them open, put them in some applesauce, and feed them to her every day. We started to see a little bit of results. But it got to where it was, I went into my retirement because it was costing us $1,200 a month for this medication for our daughter. And then we, I, I contacted a friend of mine, Charlie Watson, a long standing representative of here in the, uh, the capital. I said, Charlie, I need some help. I need to know how I can help with the medical marijuana bill that's coming up to, to be able to get this passed. He said, I'm going to get you some numbers. So he called me that afternoon. And he said, I want you to call this gentleman, this representative Bradley. He's a representative on the south side of Paul. And boy, did the friendship ever start there. I contacted Michael. He said, yes, sir. He says, we going to help your daughter. We, I got involved in a, it, it sort of toward the end of House Bill 885. I met some of the, the folks here at Shannon Hawaii and Corey, some of these ladies and gentlemen that uh, were on the front lines of this. And when I did, I met such a wonderful group of passionate people. Hey, that's a whole group of people, you know. We're all fighting for the same cause here. And that night on Saturday night, when House Bill 885 did not pass, I held my child, and I said, honey, did you come to the wind by him? And we got to stop again. And I am not going to give up until 
we have it available here in the state of Georgia for these citizens to be able to obtain a safe, effective, proven plant called cannabis. Sydney, over the years, we started taking CBD. Much like the other, it, it, it didn't prove, it didn't show us anything. It didn't have any, it didn't have any effect. But now, she's taking THC. Thanks to some generous people here in the state. That um, she's doing well. She likes to get me by the hand and take me to the table because she's hungry. She will be able to tell us when she's ready to go to sleep. She's not a worker, but she's still communicating. We see people from time to time that haven't seen her in a year's time. And they say, oh my God, I just want to live her. I see her every day. I, I, I guess I don't see her in the room of other people tell us that. And at that time, we know something's working. I just want to thank this commission again for that. And again, question. Children to marijuana, or lost their children to another drug that marijuana led to. 
And in a little bit, I'm going to speak about why THC is not all that different from what we think of as marijuana. So I want to make it clear from the get-go, uh, my life has been about helping people, especially helping young people, adolescent chemical dependency units, and so forth. This is not a war on drugs, it's a defense of the barbarians. Uh, let's be clear, Georgia tells you a little bit about us and what we do. Um, again, heart goes out to those who are suffering so much as, as we've heard here today. But there is an untold story. For the first time, perhaps, you've heard a bit of that untold story uh, with Mr. Rogers' presentation. Um, I attend substance abuse prevention conferences around the country, and there are hundreds of people in the room about the marijuana presentations because THC is becoming legalized in so many more states now. And substance abuse professionals, treatment professionals, are very, very concerned about the rise that they're seeing in the addiction rates and the abuse rates in marijuana. Those are just a couple of the effects that THC has. Just a couple of them, and the most serious, because they're deadly. So how does this relate to access? Well, the cost of increasing access to the in-state cultivation, manufacturing, as well as regulation, uh, that has to be financed. The money's going to have to come from somewhere to do that. And it's going to put uh, more Georgians in harm's way when that occurs. 5% uh, THC oil is much stronger than people think it is. And it's much stronger than I thought it was as well before I got some independent verification from several labs and clinical pharmacologists. Uh, four drops of THC oil uh, contains 10 milligrams of THC. And that's a lot of THC, four drops of 5% THC oil. Uh, 10 milligrams is what's in a standardized serving of an edible in Colorado. Uh, edibles like chocolate bars. And now Colorado has had to make the law such that edibles need to be labeled. And that label uh, concerns uh, 10 milligrams of standardized serving in each uh, chocolate bar. So just like it doesn't really matter the container that alcohol is in, it can be a Johnny Walker a Blue Label, or it can be Mad Dog 2020, uh, alcohol is alcohol. And if you drink more of the Mad Dog 2020, you're going to get just as drunk as if you drink scotch. So it's, it's similar with THC. I know that the THC bottle looks a lot nicer. It, it sounds a lot nicer to say THC oil rather than pot, rather than dope. But really, it amounts to the same thing. Whether you swallow it, whether you smoke it, it's still THC, which is a psychoactive ingredient in marijuana that gets, that causes the effect. So people can get just as drunk from either of these. People can get just as high or impaired on the road driving, or, or just as addicted. Uh, the brain and body doesn't know if one is taking in medical THC, or recreational THC. It has the same effect on the body. It has the same effect on the driver. So unfortunately, one can be just as dead from an accident on medical THC as they can on recreational THC. So it's something of a false distinction. The major difference between medical marijuana and recreational marijuana is what's on the label. You know, one says it's medical, and the other says it's recreational. So, in the law, HB 65, medical cannabis is also mentioned. And perhaps the commission is not going to study medical cannabis in general. I sure hope they don't. Because that would open the door to a wide variety of problems and issues uh, for Georgia. Because medical cannabis can mean just about anything. Uh, as you see here, it can mean cotton candy. I think everyone can see that they says medical cannabis, cotton candy. And I know that may not be the intention right now, and certainly it isn't among members of the commission. 
However, we're also dealing with the billion dollar industry seeking to become the second big tobacco. And we're going to hear more about that in later commission meetings, so I won't talk about that now. But we've got to take a look early on about branding and all kinds of other issues that are going to come up. Because when I address a high school audience of young people, uh, I ask them, how many think marijuana is a medicine? Just about every hand goes up in the sixth grade class, eighth grade class, tenth grade class. It's very unintended by the members of the commission. But we're at a point now where more Georgia kids are smoking marijuana than tobacco. We're at a point where marijuana use is going up. In, in Georgia, according to the National Household Survey, the NSDU Agents Call, which is a very prestigious survey that's done around the country. So marijuana use is not going down, it's going up in Georgia, while alcohol and tobacco use is going down. So we've got to be very concerned. Uh, also, where the real money is to be made is in the high percentage THC products, earwax, shatter. All this is called medical cannabis, in other states that are further along the line. Um, again, the, the distinction between medical marijuana and recreational can, can be a false one in some ways. Um, and I know the intentions again are very good about medical marijuana, except that many states experience their spike in use uh, when they you know, pass broad medical marijuana bills. Uh, when you pass something like intractable pain, and this is very unfortunate for people who legitimately experience intractable pain, but that can be pretty easily faked with a physician. Uh, also, physicians don't need a DEA license to certify for medical marijuana, something which I hope the commission will look into. You can lose your license to prescribe and still uh, be able to certify for medical marijuana. And that's drawn a lot of physicians to Florida who have lost their DEA license uh, because Florida has a much broader medical marijuana law than we do. So the big spike happens when commercialization happens have in medical marijuana, and you've got a lot of people using it who uh, falsely claim to have things like intractable pain or chronic pain. Patients in California other states, 90% or so, are uh, saying they have chronic pain. So, as I mentioned, broad medical legalization can lead to de facto recreational. Uh, it's just as if we were recreational if our medical uh, legalization gets, gets too broad. Activity can also have a downside uh, in that 
And this is one reason why Colorado had to label their edibles with 10 milligram uh, maximums, is that uh, when it is consumed in that way in an edible, it takes a longer time to get high. And so people don't think that it's working. And so they will take more of the edible in order to reach that high. And I know we're not talking about your son or wanting to get high by any means, but it can be the same effect whether it's medical or whether it's recreational. Uh, so it's just a concern in that sense. Um, and, and that's a that's a very valid point. Um, I, I would leave you with uh, the comment that my pastor's wife told me it was his teacher at my son's special needs school that once he became, uh, once he was holding the oil for his autism, it was almost like the static noise of the earphones came off. And, and she personally was able to teach my son how to feed himself and how to communicate that it's time to go to the bathroom. Um, so I, I certainly have some of the side effects. So I'm just not complaining about my side effects. <laughs> this other world of substance abuse treatment and prevention, and I would invite any of you to visit a substance abuse treatment facility with me. Uh, when I worked at Richview Institute in Cobb County, uh, Adolescent Chemical Dependency uh, Program, uh, we did an adolescent drug inventory, and just about every, every adolescent there was there for uh, one of their drugs of choice being marijuana. And that was a while back when THC used to be 2%. 3%, 4%, so certainly 5% is enough to get a lot of people high and a lot of people addicted. We had another question, Mr. Chairman Powell. Point five, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here for a time. What is, what is your profession? Your doctor, your time doctor? Uh, my doctorate is in uh, human development, uh, developmental psychology. Psychology. Developmental. Uh, to uh, THC impaired driving, uh, either uh, their own 
accident or being hit by somebody would never know that. So a parent wouldn't know the reason for their own child's demise because George is really not measuring it uh, but to any great extent. And we, we really need to do that. And I hope we'll see legislation next session that would really strengthen the testing for marijuana impaired and de deceased drivers. Next up, we got Jenny Helms. Approach. 
And while Jeannie's coming up, um, I want to take this time to recognize all our uh, state representatives and state senators that have taken time out of their busy day uh, to come be a part of this. So thank you all for being here. And I will let you all give them a applause. <laughs> Yeah. 
to have the dispensaries be able to deliver the product to your facilities um, or not? What's your thinking on that? We definitely need the delivery. A lot of times people living with long-term care don't have families who can go and pick it up for them, and that's a big challenge, particularly those in nursing homes. A lot of times when you see people residing in nursing homes, it's because they don't have family. So we definitely need it to be, be able to be delivered. Ms. Cloud? Similar to the delivery issue, we've encountered a lot of patients here in Georgia, whether it's their parent in a long-term facility or it's their child or teenager that may be in a residential facility. The staff in those facilities are not permitted to administer the oil. So the family member is having to leave their home in the middle of the day, maybe several times a day, go there and administer the oil because the, the staff, whether it's the local or, or a government organization for that organization that won't allow that. Is that an issue? Yes, it is. And one area that we particularly see this is when a person is terminally ill and um, a person not being a staff a person not being able to administer that morphine. And you all know that we have a significant staff shortage, nurse shortage here in Georgia. So that makes it problematic. And the more that we can make it available to be used on our side versus waiting for somebody else to show up, a family member or someone else, the better it's going to be. I don't know how many of you all have been with a person that is at the end of life with bladder cancer and seen the level of pain that there is, but it's significant. It's something we wouldn't wish on anybody. And having availability of the medical marijuana or the THC oil will make a big difference in the quality of life there at the end. So yes. No further questions. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, next up we have Virginia Galloway. Who will approach the podium. Thank you. Again, Ms. Galloway, I'm going to introduce yourself and um, who you represent and go right into your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Virginia Galloway. I'm the regional director for Faith and Freedom Coalition. And I want to uh, thank you guys, particularly for the setting the tone of having several conversations around this. Uh, this has been a hot issue down here for about five years now. Uh, and uh, there have been a lot of conversations, some civil and some not so civil. Uh, and I just appreciate you setting that tone. Um, I actually, uh, it's funny, a young man who I've never met, I, I kind of jumped on my Facebook and, you know, uh, wanted to fight with me about this. And, we ended up, I, I decided not to take offense of that, and we ended up having a really great and productive and uh, mutually informational conversation. Uh, and I think we can do that, and so I'd encourage everybody to, to keep that uh, time. Uh, Faith and Freedom uh, Coalition, well first, let me say this, we, we have been talking about this for a long time, and I've kind of been here since the beginning, it's kind of my first, one of my first issues with Faith and Freedom Coalition, and many others that we uh, work on. And um, I, I, I did tell this young man, uh, I know more about marijuana and casino gambling than any grandmother ever ought to do. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, but what we do at Faith and Freedom is we are advocates for uh, moral responsibility, for fiscal responsibility. And there are a lot of businesses who will not speak up on a hot issue because, frankly, they don't want to be targeted. Uh, they don't like conflict, they want to stay away from it. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the business end of that because Georgia certainly, uh, rightfully so, takes pride in being a business friendly state. And we're concerned that as medical access is made easier by in state cultivation, that consumption will skyrocket as it has in every other state where access has been granted, um, including teenagers and working age adults. Um, the business model for medical marijuana doesn't really work well. Uh, if you've got 5,400 customers um, and you have five different facilities, I remember a couple of years ago in one of these hearings that um, the question was asked, how much does it cost to set up you know, a, a lab that creates access to this wall um, and has all the security measures that I think people want? And uh, the answer was, I believe, $2 million just to set up. Uh, you're going to have to have a lot of customers to support that. Uh, so again, I think, uh, you know, 
it, it's pretty clear that we're going to see an uptick in use that's pretty big. Uh, so you might say, well, you know, this, these business issues are, are going to not be affected by the medical marijuana, but in fact, I, I think they really are. Uh, because for one thing, we have medical privacy laws. Uh, and so you have federal law uh, that says, you know, you can't ask your employee what medicines are using, what conditions they have, uh, all those kind of things. Uh, and so uh, I just wonder how a company is going to know that. If they're going to be allowed, if you're going to make some concession uh, in your access bill uh, to these companies to allow them to be able to protect other people in their workforce and to protect themselves. Uh, and to protect that worker. Uh, and I've, I've got a, a couple of stories about that, but I, I want to uh, talk for a minute about workforce, uh, just being able to find workforce. One of the things that makes Georgia attractive, we put a lot of investment into education and those kind of things uh, in the state. And we have a, a pretty good uh, workforce, but I will tell you, I know a contractor personally very well who spent one solid week trying to find three people to paint a building that could pass the residents. A solid week. He called one crew after another and he said, you know, you're going to have to have a drug test before you go in. And they, oh, I oh, can't do that. So, uh, I mean, this is a problem and, and we've got to, we need to address it. Uh, on the litigation side, uh, a lawyer friend of mine told me a story about a company that he represented that uh, had a man come into work who was impaired. And again, it doesn't matter if you're impaired. Your impairment is not affected by what's on that label, whether it's called medical marijuana or whether it's called recreational marijuana. This guy was impaired. He went into work. Uh, he caused a horrendous accident that killed only himself, okay, but it could have been much worse. It could have killed other people. Uh, he dropped a, a really heavy item and it uh, crushed him to death, broke out around. And uh, I mean, just a tragic situation. He was impaired by marijuana. He was found to have it in, in his bloodstream. Uh, but the family sued the company and they paid out and settled around a million dollars. And that is just something that we have got to start thinking about, is the litigation and the liability uh, that happens when you have increased access and increased usage. Um, there is some employer protection language, I understand, in the medical fields right now. Uh, if any of that has changed in any way, I think it needs to be strength, uh, strengthened. Uh, because there's legal liability contractual problems for employers who are required by state and or federal law to maintain a drug-free workplace. There's already talk out there about just getting rid of that. Um, I, with uh, a lot of people I know working in construction, I hope they don't get rid of that because, again, there's danger to people who are not using or abusing or whatever. Um, one example is commercial driver's license. Uh, those drivers are under federal DOT drug and alcohol testing requirements. Companies that have a state contract in excess of $25,000 or a federal contract in excess of $100,000 uh, have to maintain a drug free workplace. What are we going to do with that? Uh, also, it undermines the state law enacted by the Georgia legislature in 1993 that makes a state mandated discount on workers' compensation insurance available to state certified drug free workplaces. So again, we cause legal liability for more than 7,500 state certified drug free workplaces that we have in Georgia. That's a lot of employers to have a problem. Uh, so while we're working on this supply issue, I hope that we'll remember the practical implications for business and uh, come up with some solutions there. We really can't pass enough laws to solve all these problems because we have a culture uh, that um, Frankly, it's just it's been exact, uh, just growing exponentially uh, with promoting marijuana as medicine. And I understand there's two sides uh, to that story of people who benefit and that kind of thing, but we also need to look 
uh, and who is hurt and what we can do uh, in a really serious way. I mean, there's a lot of joking. I'm down here at the Capitol. I hear a lot of joking about this. I, you know, it's not really funny to me. Just got to say, uh, because I know people uh, who have suffered greatly uh, with problems related to marijuana. Uh, parents, children, uh, a lot of children in our uh, DFAT system right now because their parents are, are not responsible because of their age. So, uh, anyway, that's all I've got to say. I'll answer any questions that anyone has. Oh, I didn't have to run my hand, sorry. Uh, there's a book that I proved that out uh, that I think is really super. It's called uh, What Will Legal Marijuana Cost Employers? And that is not just talking about recreational, it's just any legal marijuana. Uh, talks about litigation, safety, compliance, productivity, and flexibility. Uh, I have the website that you can download that from, and I will uh, ask them to pass this down uh, to you guys so that you can look at it at your leisure. But I think it's an excellent book, and I would highly recommend it. So a white paper that's well researched. Thank you, Virginia. Um, I'm going to paraphrase you. You said we cannot pass enough laws put in necessary protections. I think you underestimate this legislation. We passed a lot of laws. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you do, and, and, I, and I get that. And I, and I uh, respect good intentions, um, but we also know that when you have a culture that uh, is pushing one way, that, that really there's not enough law that can, can, can be passed. Even, even the best laws are not going to hold down everything well, that you want to do. I, I want to go back to your contractor friend that said he couldn't find enough workers because of drug tests. How many of those people that failed drug tests had a medical THC oil Well, the interesting thing is none of them uh, would even go and take the drug test. They didn't fail the test. They just refused to even show up for the job. So I, I, I don't know if that's the right answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, David. Uh, Ms. Virginia, thank you. We've known each other for a very long time in the Republican Party and here at the Capitol. And I do appreciate you coming today and, and uh, engaging in the civil discourse. Uh, I think it's something that we can accomplish and, and this commission is committed to that. Um, and as someone, uh, as an employer of roughly 100 employees, it's something that, that we face. And I've actually uh, been working with Congressman Ferguson at the federal level, very happy about the bill uh, he co sponsored that protects patients in various states that have the legal cards from being fired from their federal employment. Um, and I hope that passes. But my, my question you brought up the possibility of uh, employer protection and employees at work. Why could we not, and I'm assuming that those same protections already exist for opioids, that everybody apparently takes opioids, and most likely they, they come to work. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming, have you looked into what are the current opioid laws, and why could we just not apply those same laws as far as your point of employing your protection and just apply them the same? Uh, that'd be okay with me. I really, uh, opioids are another, been another grandmother non specialty that I've had to start learning about. I haven't really gotten all the way up to speed on that. I'll admit I attended a couple of conferences. Uh, I, I, I recognize that that's a problem. And actually, opioid abuse is a problem uh, that is usually preceded by marijuana abuse. 94% uh, of people who abuse opioids have abused marijuana first. So, um, you know, I think they're very related, so that's a great question. Okay. I, I, my point of view is normally people come to me to try to get all the book um, with campus, but thank you again.
chair one. A lot of times it's going to be a waste. It just fails on about people going to work. And I think uh, Mr. Powell said, people go to work all the time and take pain medication. And on the bottom it says, do not operate machinery. And they still do that every day. And to the fact that I've got about 550 people in my jail today. And I would be willing to say 80% of them are there due to some kind of drug abuse, whether it's robbery, domestic violence, or theft, you name it. It's tied around drug abuse. Yeah, okay. And if I thought, if I thought for one minute that me sitting on this commission would make that situation worse, I wouldn't be sitting here in the truth I'm here because I believe and I know there are people in our state, men and women and children, and I've seen some of them that need help. And this work, this does help them. And I want to make this commission, I want to be part of this commission to make it as safe as we can. Do not give it to people to abuse, but really help those in need. That's really why I'm here. But I thank you for your abuse. And thank you for that. And I, <laughs> um, I would like to say that, that you're right. You don't normally hear a uh, parent crying that their child is addicted to, to medical marijuana at this point. Uh, but we've just opened up you know, a lot of different conditions. And uh, you know, your brain, as uh, Dr. Raduca, who is, I mean, just stellar in this field. I mean, he opened the Ritchie Institute uh, Drug Treatment Center. He was the, the man responsible for that uh, years ago, and so he has tons of experience here. But um, the part of your brain that uh, recognizes and forms an addiction doesn't read a label. It doesn't know if it's medical marijuana or it's some other kind of marijuana addiction. Uh, breeds more addiction and actually kind of um, gets that part of your brain activated. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, my understanding from what I've, I've heard at, at conferences uh, that I've gone to on this issue is that no matter what what the addiction is, it can be uh, video games, it can be you know, a number of different things. You start that addiction center going, it's much easier uh, to that pathway is kind of smooth in your mind for other addictions. So that, I, just, I just want to speak here for Look, I hope that anybody would realize that a person who has five grandchildren and four children does not want people suffering and hurting. Uh, that, that's not my goal at all. I want people help. I also want to make sure that we uh, don't hurt a whole lot of other people in the process. So I just would uh, caution uh, the committee to do those things like that. Thank you. To my fellow citizens on the council, uh, we have uh, had conversations about this in the past. I'm glad to have you. We've always had civil conversations. We have. They've been robust. That's right. We're robust uh, people. <laughs> and I, yes. And, I, and I, you know, looking back on that, um, I'm thankful for those conversations because I think it challenges us to dig deeper into why we believe what we believe. Um, a serious question. If we were able to find that, that, that center area, or whether it be that perfect point or that center area where we could, knowing that we have high levels of addiction with opioids currently being prescribed by the FDA. If we could find um, that, that lane where we are able to provide this medicine to the people in our state that need it, that are registered to where we have that robust medical registry system, we know the people on the system, we know the ones who have the cards, the ones who have the cards are using the oil. We're able to protect employers. We're able to have a system much like Mr. Jackson referred to was the same regulations that are on opioids in the workplace, the same protections that employers have when it comes to those types of prescription medications. We're able to put this in that same lane, that the same cautions and protections are there. Uh, we are able to have uh, robust uh, law enforcement at the table. Is, there, is that a lane you could be in with me to support? If we're doing it 
in, in answering those concerns and making sure that those, those folks who need that medicine is getting that medicine. Mm -hmm. We have those regulatory procedures around it. Mm -hmm. Is that something we can share? Um, possibly. There, there's, this is a complex issue, as we all know by now. Uh, and, and so there, there are many facets to this issue. I spoke to this years ago when we had a committee meeting. I brought up five different areas that I had concern about. Uh, and, and many of them have come to pass already. Access was one of my concerns. Okay, we might sleep on it, but I get it. Oh, don't worry about it. You <laughs> know, that's what I was told. Uh, but here we are. Uh, so, uh, you know, I almost have to, to write another booklet for you. Uh, but, but, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to have a discussion. Uh, everybody wants to help people who are suffering. Uh, I think we, we lay that out first, and we all agree on that. Um, and I hope that we all agree that nobody wants to make any more laws that have unintended consequences that hurt a whole lot of other people. So uh, that's kind of uh, a hard balance to reach. I don't know if it's uh, possible or impossible, but uh, I'm always willing to talk. I'm going to quote a movie, Dumb and Dumber. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs>
uh, fall and figure out a solution in the next session to really help you get some people stuff. Well, let's, let's keep talking. Thank you, Ms. Gallo. There's no further questions. Thank you. All right, next up we've got Terry Thrower. Um, Ms. Thrower, you can, we can get you a mic there. Or coming to the podium? Okay. While she's making her way up, you know, I think Representative Clark brings up a, a great point. And, you know, that's why it's important that we hear from both sides of this issue. Um, we all can agree that we have an opioid epidemic. And as we're as we're moving through this process, we want to learn from those mistakes so that we won't create the same um, tornado that we have with that. So, um, but with that, we've got um, again, Ms. Terry Throw, if you just introduce yourself and um, a little bit about yourself while you're here for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me speak to you all today. My name is Terry Thrower, and I'm here because I am a medical cannabis user. I'm already getting emotional about that. Um, <clears throat> I only have lived with chronic pain for 52 years. I have a condition called juvenile idiopathic arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease that destroys the cartilage conjoints and has destroyed the cartilage and joints throughout my body, including my spine, uh, and caused my blindness. Um, what, what vision I have in my left eye is there because I'm using an arsenal of pharmaceuticals to keep my glaucoma pressures below 15. I have been on opioids, steroids, NSAIDs, biologics, and experimental arthritis drugs whatever it took to keep me in less pain and functioning. Um, I, I brought to the committee, or the commission, um, some handouts. I didn't print slides. I apologize for that. On the, on the left side of the page uh, is my uh, full skeletal structure. And I want to point out that in the years between 2006 and 2015, I had 10 surgeries to revise or replace the joints in my lower body or fix broken bones. Um, prednisone causes glaucoma and it also um, caused my bones to go soft. Osteoporosis and the onset. <coughs> Um, those surgeries caused some additional nerve damage, some of them, to my lower limbs, and um, I have neuropathic pain in my legs. Um, and during that time, during that nine-year period, I was prescribed opioids during, um, before and after each surgery. So that's nine solid years of opioid use. <clears throat> My first experience with medical cannabis was in Illinois when I tried to reduce my opioid intake with medical cannabis. And it, that was a lot of trial and error. I soon discovered that I did not like getting high from the higher THC uh, strains that were offered at the dispensaries there. But I finally found a lower THC, higher CBD strain that worked for what I needed it to do without getting me loaded. Um, the picture on the right is of my current cervical spine. We don't think about this, but our spinal column is also a series of joints um, connected via cartilage. Um, and my debilitating condition was damaging and destroying the bones in my neck throughout my lifetime. In October of 2016, just one year after I finished uh, my PhD in Chicago, I was uh, experiencing symptoms of spinal cord compression. My hands uh, started to go numb and I was losing coordination, which for a blind woman is not a good thing. Um, I was feeling electric light shocks from my head to my toes and I was stumbling and falling a lot. The test revealed 
that I <clears throat> that my cervical spine was collapsing on itself and compressing the spinal cord. And I was told that if I didn't have and a relatively urgent surgery to fuse my cervical spine, that I would become quadriplegic within a matter of months, and that my life expectancy would be a little more than a year. So that surgery left me unable to move my neck because it fused the bones uh, with metal instrumentation from my skull to my third thoracic vertebra. <clears throat> it also decompressed my spinal cord and saved my life, for which I'm very, very and hard to get. Um, I fully 
fully support the conservative approach that Georgia has taken in implementing their low THC program. Um, not all Georgians need medical cannabis oil to function, but many of us do. And I believe that together, Georgians can create a system that works for people with better access, more affordable, high quality, regulated access to cannabis oil. And speaking for myself and many others, I'm depending on it. Thank you. Symptoms vary by individual and range from 
numbness or tingling to walking difficulties, fatigue, dizziness, pain, depression, blindness, and paralysis. People living with MS may experience relapses and remissions of neurological symptoms or their symptoms may progress over time. FDA approved disease modifying therapies are effective at limiting the number of relapses and disease progression. However, they do not specifically treat MS symptoms. Optimal symptom management requires a comprehensive approach, and THC oil can be used as a complementary therapy to manage MS symptoms, especially pain, specificity, and urinary frequency. Heather, I'm going to stop you there. Okay. As a, as a son of a patient with MS, I appreciate all your work. But for sake of time, we're going to move to the next one. Uh, Jennifer Conforti, private citizen, tell us where you're from. You're otherwise known as Abby's mom. I live in Fayetteville, Georgia. I have a daughter who's seven and a half years old with severe autism and a congenital brain defect. She was severely injurious. Uh, she would harm herself quite a bit about four years ago until I decided to figure out how in the world to make my own medical cannabis in my kitchen. I called a gentleman in California. He told me I had to go buy an ounce of loud weed. <laughs>
but fails to provide the legal means to access it. The Georgia General Assembly should immediately pass a comprehensive medical marijuana law. Georgia's families deserve to have more than an empty right without a remedy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Medicinal, medicinal cannabis 
Because there is no need to do this, here's why. Hear me out, please. One, patients will have access later this fall to low THC oil via Epidiolex. This drug is a purified marijuana extract that is 99% cannabidiol, or CBD. Patients already have access now to THC. Marinol and sesame are capsules containing 100% THC. Syndros, recently approved by the FDA, is liquid THC. And that can be combined with epidiolites, meaning that you have safety and efficacy proven through the FDA. FDA has approved these drugs to treat epilepsy, chemotherapy-related vomiting, and AIDS wasting. But once approved by FDA, doctors can prescribe them off-label for any condition. These are nationally regulated products that contain no contaminants. Marijuana medicines that states have legalized are unregulated products. They often contain impurities that can hurt and sometimes have actually killed people. Visit the marijuanareport.org slash tag slash contaminants to see the problems that states are having with mold and mildew and pesticides and E. coli and salmonella in medical marijuana that they, products that they have uh, legalized. Legislators who say cultivated pot will not lead to recreational pot seem at best disingenuous. A member of this joint study committee is past president of a five-year-old, $100 million Atlanta medical marijuana company whose chairman plans to enter the recreational market. This company, Certera, has contributed to the campaigns of Georgia legislators, including another member of this committee. This seems to us like a major conflict of interest. Again, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. You have none. Mr. McCurry. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. If I speak too fast, you can't hear me to say something. Good afternoon. Thank you, Don. Thank you again for letting me speak. Uh, my name is Joseph McCurry. I am a graduate student at Georgia State University for the uh, Master's of Education or for additional literacy uh, masters. And I am representing the state of Georgia, the citizens, the sick and tired people who have been sick and tired. And the main thing I like to address for any purposes is that I believe that Georgia can successfully operate a secure and regulated medicinal cannabis program that will benefit its citizens and their families, especially since Florida operates terror. Well, this is headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, and their business is doing extraordinarily well since so now with three organizations licensed to cultivate, extract, and dispense approved medical marijuana in Texas. Uh, with this being said, I spoke with Mr. Peter Earl this year, and he also spoke that some schools in state Georgia would be allowed to grow. May I also suggest that we have two land grant state institutions in the state of Georgia, UGA and Fort Valley. Those two campuses are agricultural based schools. They have a lot of resources, tools, and supplies, and land that can instantly cultivate for the state of Georgia. Also, you have 18, 18 state uh, department of health in the state of Georgia. And we also, if I'm not mistaken, we have university schools located within those regions. So, if anything, we should be allowed to. Uh, surveys of the schools will be allowed to grow and cultivate uh, in those areas where we do have the Department of Health, 30 seconds. And also with that, I represent the GBES, which is the Georgia Network Education Therapy and Support System, where they service over 60,000 kids in the state of Georgia with issues made from autism, uh, epilepsy, remodel retardation. These kids are in school, and they can also benefit like those kids in Illinois, Colorado, where the nurses have been allowed to give them CPO on school campus. So again, as far as access, we can also mimic the mission model to create secure access. Thank uh, you, Mr. McCurry. Thank you. Next up, Nicole. Good job, Kurt. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, committee, for allowing me to speak, for allowing all of us to speak today. My name is Nicole Antoinette Lafong. March of 2017, I was diagnosed with HIV and chronic kidney disease. My doctors treated me with heavy narcotics, and when they reduced the dosage, I experienced opioid withdrawal. And in that moment, I made a conscious decision not to use pharmaceuticals to manage pain ever again. Cannabis was my only safe choice. I immediately began to 
to immerse myself in the facts. The law, the history of prohibition, and the medical benefits. The more I learned, I realized that I could choose the natural and holistic route to healing my body and constantly risk my freedom, or the legal path of toxic and legal pharmaceuticals, eventually leading to kidney failure or worse. A study conducted at the University of Washington last year proved that heavy cannabis use, along with the antiretroviral treatment, helps to suppress the HIV. Why are my legislators making decisions for me that only me and my doctor need to be making for my treatment? My doctors and I have discussed the best treatment for me, and juicing the plant raw is the best treatment. And 5% THC is not enough for cannabinoid to manage my pain efficiently. I need the full spectrum of the plant in order to fight the virus. As the Georgia chapter president of Minorities with Medical Marijuana, I introduced myself as a cannabis patient and advocate. I quickly realized that I was not alone in this fight for common sense reform. We began a campaign with the support of organizations like Students for Sensible Drug Policy, and our goal is to register as many new veteran voters as we can, inspire the next generation of leaders to be the change they want to see in the world, to elect legislators that actually serve as constituents and are not persuaded by the deep pockets of Big Pharma and the private prison system. This soon-to-be-healed woman that stands before you is asking that the committee provide safe access to the entire plant for me and thousands of other patients in the state that need it. I'm also asking that the committee takes a serious look at allowing patients to grow their own medicine. The plant keeps me off of deadly opioids. Thank you, Nicole. for jury nullification. 
because the law is not right. No one has the right to tell anyone else what they can and cannot do to treat themselves. One in six Americans today are on some sort of psychotic drugs, psychiatric drugs. Those drugs have long-term health effects, which could be easily replaced with cannabis of some sort. The opioid crisis is a ridiculous problem we have right now. In every state that they've legalized cannabis, opioid deaths have decreased by 25%. I could go on, but I can yield my time to someone else. I think yield is a great idea. What was the name again? Ted Lentz. Ted Lentz. Where do you want this? Okay. Thank you, Ted. 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 Thank you, Hi, my name is Greg Criswell. I'm speaking on behalf of my wife of 33 years. Greg Criswell is right here in the, uh, the audience. So thank you, Commission, uh, especially for adding intractable pain and PTSD to, to HB65. Uh, to give you some perspective, my wife has recently uh, got a car. She's transitioned completely to medical cannabis. So from the perspective of four years of chronic pain, chronic spine pain, peripheral neuropathy, she is now completely off of the opiates and no longer relies on opioid medication for her quality of life. And I, I believe that is huge. The fact that she walked up here today, walked up these steps, and not, she could not have done that you know, several months ago. Absolutely impossible. So from, from that perspective, you know, the, this, is, this is huge. Access is very difficult. I'd love to see us get some access here where we can legally obtain high quality oil that's been tested and, and very, very safe. Um, from, from her perspective, and, and I heard a lot of, I heard a lot of things today about debilitating conditions. There's obviously a desperate need for these families with, with, with you know, children with epilepsy. I mean, that is a clear cut need. But there's also a people that just want a better quality of life. She's a mom, you know, she's, you know, she's a wife, she's a daughter, and we're soon to be grandparents in a few months. So we got the, you know, so she's going to be the one chasing the kid around. <laughs> I'm too tired. From that perspective, I'll, I'll quote something that she says quite often. I just want to feel better. And you know, the results are, are very, very well. Thank you again to the commission. Thank you, Rivers, to the Pete, for all your efforts. And I'll get some more time to these folks. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Charles Walker.
how are you able to pass a law that will define and legitimate the roles of the growers and distributors as to ease the stress of people like me, a man whose mental capacity is not what it used to be? Would a timeline, will a timeline, and likelihood of this law being passed look like? Because time's not on my side. Thank you, Charles. Cannabis or recommend cannabis for patients taking the first breath to the last breath. 
but we can get access. Um, please allow them public schools. A lot of caregivers are single parents, so we got to remove our kids to give them to get the uh, medicine, how to keep a job, plus take their kid out every four hours. Uh, I agree that the universities uh, with agriculture programs grow, UGA and Fort Valley. Um, expungement of records for nonviolent cannabis crimes, let's please bring it up. And uh, as we make legislation, let's not forget what makes Georgia great. And, what's, and what makes Georgia great is our diversity. And right now, brown and black people make up less than 1% of this 50 billion dollar market. Let's make sure there's some inclusion as you're right, our laws. Um, thank you, Dr. Hodge. Thank you. We all know that the arrest rate has been to 91 in most major cities. And uh, the, the, the rate of use has been equal to black and whites. And again, blacks are suffering from this failed drug war. So let's make sure there's some inclusion. Thank you, Dr. Hodge. Okay. Here's your work. We're seven minutes past the 30 minute extension. Um, so, what we're going to do, I'm going to do five more um, members of the commission. I'm going to save your time.